Hey guys, this is Agent Mindstorm, and welcome back to my Bedrock Edition resource pack tutorial. Today we're going to learn how to create animated textures. If you don't have Paint.net installed yet, watch the Editing Textures video in the playlist in the description first. I'd also recommend watching the Advanced Editing Tools video to learn how to use the selection tools because we need to use them to create animated textures. If you're caught up on all that, we can start the tutorial. The first thing we need to do today is understand how an animated texture file looks. All block textures are 16 by 16 pixels by default. An animated texture is made up of a bunch of those 16 by 16 textures stacked vertically. The top square is the first frame of the animation, the one below it is the second frame, all the way down to the bottom, which is the last frame. Minecraft has a few animated textures by default that you can look at to understand what I'm talking about. Some of these are kelp, fire, and the stonecutter saw. The file is named exactly how any other texture is named. If you're replacing an existing texture, just name it the same thing as the texture you replaced. It'll save you a lot of future annoyance that way. If you loaded up the game to check how your animated texture looks right now, you'd be disappointed to find out that it isn't animated at all and just looks wrong. This is because an animated texture needs to have an entry in the flipbooktextures.json file to work right. We could edit the file in Notepad, but JSON is much easier to edit in a program called Notepad++. Go to this page, link in the description, which has the download for Notepad++. You want the latest version, so pick whichever one is on top. Download and launch the exe file to start the installation. Select your language, I'm going to use English for this video, and then click Next, then agree to the license. On this screen, you can select which parts of the program you want to install. We're going to go ahead with the default installation, but you can change it if you know what you're doing. Click Next, then you're on the final page. I would recommend that you select the desktop shortcut, but that's just me. Hit install to finish the process. Now that we have Notepad++ installed, navigate to your flipbooktextures.json file, right-click it, and open it in Notepad++. This screen is probably intimidating with all its colors and lines and symbols, but we're going to break it down so you understand what each part of JSON means. For starters, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, which isn't important, but I'm sure you were wondering. There are three main rules that you need to follow while creating JSON. The first is that everything that opens must close. Every opening bracket and quotation mark has to have a closing bracket or quotation mark somewhere after it. The second rule is that in a list, each property should be separated by a comma. The third rule is that every property is made up of a string in quotation marks, a colon after the ending quotation mark, and a JSON value afterward. A lot of what I just said probably sounds like word salad to you, so let's break it down even further. This is an example of JSON code. This line that says player is an object, which is something that has the properties of anything between the starting and ending curly brackets. If we want to add properties to player, we start a new line between the curly brackets and type a quotation mark. All properties that we add to objects start with a string. We typed a quotation mark because all strings in JSON need to have quotation marks around them. A string is basically a long line of letters and numbers and characters that can be as long as you want, but you can't use any quotation marks, commas, or backslashes in it. If your string has multiple words, it's better to separate them with underscores than spaces. With the string naming the property quoted, we need to type the definition of the property. First, we have to put a colon after the end quotation mark of the string. This tells the JSON that the words in the string have the definition of the value after it. Values can be typed a few different ways. They can be a string or an object, as previously mentioned, but there are other accepted values too. If your value is a number, it should be typed as the number alone with no quotation marks. Your value can also be true, false, or null, which is the only time that JSON accepts words without quotation marks around them. Finally, the value can also be an array. An array is similar to an object, except that it's marked with square brackets instead of curly ones. The easiest way to think about it is that an object lists the properties of one thing, while the array is a bunch of different things that fit under one umbrella. When your string, colon, and value are all entered in the line, you have to decide whether or not to put a comma at the end. If you want to list more properties after the current one, you need to end the line with a comma. If your current property is the last one you want, you should not put a comma at the end. With all that entered into the JSON, we now know our player is named Bob, their level is 1, they are alive, and that their favorite numbers are 1, 3, 7, and 11. White space is invisible in JSON. That means that tabs, spaces, and line endings, which are what pressing enter is called, don't affect the JSON at all. The spacing is all for readability. This code is just as valid as this code. 
even though the second one is a lot harder for us to read. Time for a quick review. JSON objects define a string with a list of properties. Each property has a string, a colon, and then a value that can be its own string, object, array, number, or true, false, or null. Quotation marks are used around strings. A comma should be placed at the end of a property line if there are more properties afterward. Now that we know the basics of JSON, we can apply it to the flipbook textures.json file. The whole file is an array, as we can tell from the square brackets at the start and end of the document. In the array are many different flipbook textures objects that list a texture file path, the atlas to know which texture to replace, and the animation information about each texture. Let's start simple by looking at the nether portal animation. Quite simply, there's no special code here. The flipbook texture property lists the file path starting from the resource pack folder to the nether portal texture. The atlas tile below is simply portal. But why? To answer this question, we have to use another JSON file. TerrainTexture.json TerrainTexture.json is in the same file as FlipbookTextures.json. Open it in Notepad++. This file has lots of uses, but today we're only going to use it as a map to the correct atlas tile value for your animated texture. Use Ctrl F to search for the name of your texture. Since we're currently looking at the portal animation, we're going to search for portal. If we look at what we found the first time, it's actually the end portal entry. Make sure that the entry you find is the exact correct name of the texture or else you'll replace the wrong one. If you got the wrong texture, just continue pressing find until the finder lands in the right one. Here we are at the file path for portal. The atlas tile value is the string that's defined by the object that contains the file path property. For the portal texture, it's simply portal. That's lucky for us, but a lot of blocks atlas tiles use a value other than the name of the texture. Always check terrain texture.json for the correct atlas tile value of the texture you want. Let's look at a slightly more advanced animated texture now. Kelp Top. This texture has flipbook texture and atlas tile properties just like the portal texture, but there are two more after them. The first is ticks per frame. This is the amount of game time it takes for an animated texture to move to the next frame. 20 game ticks are one second in real life, so the kelp top texture will change five times a second. The next property, frames, is an array that tells the game which of the frames to use in the animation and the order of those frames. The top frame on the texture is frame 0, the second is frame 1, and so on. This frames array is telling the game to play all 20 frames of the kelp texture in order from 0 to 20. If you don't list the ticks per frame or frames properties, the game will default to one tick per frame and use every frame of the texture starting from the top. The last major property we need to mention for animated textures is blend frames. This property can only be true or false. By default, blend frames is true. This controls whether or not the texture will fade from frame to frame. If you set blend frames to false, the fade will be skipped and the texture immediately changes to the next frame. If you're looking through the properties of the default animated textures, you'll probably notice a few that I didn't talk about. Those properties are only used on bubble columns and flowing liquids, so they should be left the way they are by default. Now that we know all about JSON structure and the flipbook textures.json file, let's create an animated texture of our own. My idea is to make an animated sand texture that flickers through a few different colors. We'll start by opening the basic sand texture in paint.net. To make the image long enough to fit multiple frames, we'll increase the canvas size. Since we want to have four frames, we'll set the height of the image to 4 times 16, which is 64 pixels. Let's expand the image downward and hit enter. Now that we have space for the second, third, and fourth frames, let's add them to the image as layers. They all stack on top of one another, so we have to select the layer of frame 2 and move it to be directly under frame 1. We have to repeat the process for frames 3 and 4. Once all the frames are in the correct position, we can flatten the image to one layer and save it in our resource pack's textures blocks folder as sand.png. The texture for our sand is complete, but we need to add the JSON object for sand to our flipbook textures file. We can start by copying the flipbook textures.json file from the default resources and putting it in our textures folder. Let's open the file in Notepad++ to edit it. The easiest way to start a new object for a texture animation is to copy one that already exists. We're going to find an animation that closely matches what we want to control about our sand animation. Kelp will be the starting point for us because it already has ticks per frame and frames properties. We copy the kelp object and paste it at the bottom of the array. Because we just added a new object to the flipbook textures array, we have to add a comma after the campfire log lit object. Our copy of the kelp object is the one at the end of the array, so we should remove the comma at the end of it. Now that our object fits into the array, 
we have to change its properties to make it control the sand animation. First, we're going to change the file path that leads to kelp A to instead lead to our sand texture. Afterward, we have to check the terrain texture.json file for the correct atlas tile for sand. We have to skip past sandstone to get to the object for just sand, but luckily it says our atlas tile is simply sand. After we enter sand into the atlas tile property, we should choose our ticks per frame. Sand is very common in the world, and I don't want to give anyone seizures, so I'm going to make the frames change one time per second, which is 20 ticks. Finally, we have to decide the order of the frames. I want the frames to go from the top to the bottom in order, and then go in reverse order from bottom to top. The top frame is 0, so we're going to count 0, 1, 2, 3, and then back 2, 1. We don't add a 0 at the end, because when the frames loop, they loop back to 0. Let's clear the existing frames array because it's for kelp, and we want to start from an empty array. We still have to follow the comma rules of JSON though, so when we type 0, we have to put a comma after it. We can enter the rest of the code the same way, going 0, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, but we have to remember not to add a comma after the last number because it's the end of the array. Our object for the sand animation is now complete, so we can save the file and close Notepad++. Let's test the pack in game now. I'm loading up the seed picker's desert village seed because that's the easiest way to see a lot of sand. Oh my gosh. Okay. Ooh. It, it doesn't go super far, which is probably for the better, because I think we would be killing everyone if it did go very far. I tried to make it not kill everybody be by giving it, like, uh, this nice little... Uh, it's not... it's not... <laughs> it didn't help. Oh my gosh. So yeah, guys, there you go. That's the end of today's tutorial, and in other news, the end of all texture-related resource pack tutorials. Next time, we'll talk about sounds, music, and other sound-related stuff. For now, I do want to tell you all, thanks for watching, and I will see you later.